Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Coming up on Off 90, go behind the scenes during the filming of an internet sitcom made in Rochester called The Barn Bar. Ed Kruger of Wyckoff kept everything he ever owned. Now his trash and treasures are on display for the public. Come with us for a tour of Ed's museum. Check out the playfully theistic works of Winona painter Mary Solberg. Then come with us to Austin and explore the unique and whimsical sculptures created by mixed media artist Leo Malo. It's all just ahead, Off 90. I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Ever wish you and your friends could get together and make up a sitcom? <laughs> That's what the folks behind Rochester's Barn Bar have done. The result is a humorous and often unpredictable locally grown production. Go behind the scenes with us during the filming of an episode as we interview the makers of this YouTube comedy. Can we get everybody to take their places, please? Uh, action! Oh, I'm home! Thank the good lord I'm home! Hey, what does it take to get a waitress around this <laughs> Describing barn bar is a very difficult thing. It's like Twin Peaks meets Monty Python meets Cheers. You mean a full-blown psychotic episode? It could happen. Mm. Ooh, that'd be a nice break in the day, wouldn't it? Ooga, but, but, Nietzsche. It's kind of like a cross between Cheers and Deliverance. Nietzsche, no, 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 Nietzsche. Lycanfroid. It's a combination of Cheers, Prairie Home Companion, and um, Twin Peaks. It's almost like being at a bar and collaborating with your friends. Would you like a little vodka? The atmosphere is almost like a party, but with a purpose. Yeah, let's just blunder our way through this. It's kind of like that old Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland premise, like, hey kids, let's put on a show. We can use Bob's barn. It's like, uh, we've actually done that as adults. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's still 10 bucks, dude. Bob, Bob! While you're gone, can I be in charge of the bar? No. Oh, oh my God, no. I'll take care of that situation as soon as I figure out who I am. Oh, it's really tacky. Yeah, I weren't tacky enough, apparently. He definitely has some explaining to do. Yeah, don't we all? Well, he said that he's got this crazy idea to have people come out to his barn, that he's made a set, and that we could come up with our own characters and kind of improv and build a theater show that we would put on the internet. You could act surprised and get up. Joey so could give you a mean look. I don't know, but... I think there is a, a strong flavor of what it is like to live in Minnesota. A lot of it's stereotypical, but it, it's true. I mean, the goofy accents that we play up. What in the name of Hacksaw Jim Duggan are you hollering about? Um, the fact that, you know, it's cold and there's nothing to do and we're in a small town, so everybody's in a bar and just drinking. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town clear across the country and that's the same thing there. So it's kind of a, it's a common theme that a lot of people can uh, relate to. What would you say the Cubs have been doing to me for the last 27 years. Yeah, and they didn't even buy you dinner. Yeah, or have a cigarette afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> They're really just a weird, wacky bunch of misfits in this very fictional small town. He's been getting in touch with his inner smelt. Oh boy, that's, that's frightening. I get a lot of things like, is that you in that barn bar thing? Sliding home to the promised land. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm proud to say it's me in that barn bar thing. My name is Bob Sanborn, and I am the originator of the show Barn Bar. 
it takes place here in my barn, and I play the character of Nervous Bob, who is the bartender. A good friend of mine who has a theater company down in Chicago has complimented me a few times with the comment that he still hasn't understood anything that's happened, but he loves it. You kidnapped Slider? <laughs> yeah! Awesome! <laughs> Can we eat it? I'm hungry. I'm gonna pull your stitchy nose! We're going into season four, so we have completed three seasons. I get all my ideas at three o'clock in the morning. I wake up and I have ideas, and, and I write them down. The guy that's with him will kind of peel off and head over that direction. The idea for this came to me in its entirety, you know, waking up from some dream. I would say probably through here. So the next logical thing seemed to be to put it on YouTube. My name is Chris Atwood. My character's name is Brian Wilcox. The beauty of it was there was no set rehearsal. There wasn't, you know, six weeks or 12 weeks out of my life where I was going to be here five nights a week away from my family or work. So every two weeks we'd get together out here and basically just goof off. Strange guy. Deeply troubled. My name is Debbie Novell. My character is DL. I love Barn Bar because it's unique. It's unusual. So I've done a lot of theater, and a lot of people don't want to have to have the obligation of, of rehearsals and memorization and so forth. So that was appealing to me. Come on, yeah. I need details. Uh -oh. My name is Lisa Lewis Grill. I play a character called Patty Wormwood. Look at this place. How could you not want to come here? What a great thing to do. You can produce a show, you can fulfill your artistic uh, needs, but you can sit and be with this wonderful group of creative people. They're funny. <laughs> they're kind. They're energetic. And I can't think of a better thing to do with my Thursday night. <laughs> Get ready. Go. Turn off the ignition. We've evolved quite a bit over the years with, with that whole process of how the show is produced and how, how it uh, comes into being. Um, two begins here. At this stage, what, what we're doing now is that we will write a script in advance. So the actors and technicians will have a chance to look the script over in advance. And then uh, I'll schedule a night or two for everyone to come out and do the taping. Uh, we'll go through this probably two or three times as a wide shot. And then it'll go into the hands of the um, film editor. The episodes are only about five to seven minutes long. And um, we shoot, basically we shoot an episode in a night. Quiet please, action. He's got some lighting set up out there and then I'll bring a um, camera and stuff and set up. Duct tape. Fixes everything, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> and shoot whatever we can in a limited period of time and we go boom, 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 boom. Action! 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 Bob! 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 Wake up! And, and uh, when it's done then I go try to make something out of whatever I got. <laughs> I like it because I don't keep a journal and I don't take enough pictures of my life. But I can go back and watch season one, which is from three years ago, and go, oh my gosh, I remember that weekend that we were out here and then how much fun that was. And to think how nervous I was the first time I came out here, because I didn't know Bob that well. Didn't know some of the fellow actors and actresses that I would, I'd be working with. And now I go, oh, now these are my pals that are, you know, my friends that if I see in the grocery store, I'm running up and giving them a hug because we built a relationship through working together. I love the experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything, and I, I would always want to do it no matter what the end product. Andy, Andy come on, man. Oh, we got it. 
because the most important thing about doing the show is that everyone should leave here having had a really good time. <laughs> and that's where you come in. Um, Some people go, well, nobody watches that show, or I can't even get my wife to watch, you know, an episode, and I, I, I've, I've gotten over that over the years because I don't really care. It doesn't matter who else watches them and how they look when they're finished. It's that I had fun making the shows with my friends. One on one isn't always two in the barn bar. Sometimes it's like four and a half. It's one of those things that you just never know what's gonna happen. And that, that's what's wonderful about the performance. You just don't know. So when you're watching it, you don't know what's gonna happen next. And, and we don't either when we're in it. Just come in and see what happens. Hey, who wants another drink? Oh, yeah. oh, I do! For 63 years, Ed Kruger ran the general store in Wyckoff, and he never threw anything away. <laughs> he meticulously categorized, boxed, and labeled everything he owned. He willed everything to the town of Wyckoff, and now the town has taken it upon itself to showcase his collection of mid-20th century trash and treasures. It's overwhelming. People can't believe it. That this is all one's man's possessions. It's just, they can't believe it. Have you ever seen Ed's museum? Oh, you should come. Everything in it belonged to Edwin Krieger. There's nothing in there that wasn't here. Uh, he run the grocery store, and he just never threw anything away. Here we have old cereal boxes that were left uh, in the store. Uh, this. This uh, is a very valuable bottle because that has the, the whole Jack Spratt figurine on. We had to put, there was one railing on here, but in order to have people come up here, you had to, we had to have two railings, so. According to the law. This thing, when Edwin was, uh, worked with the painter in town, They'd put Edwin in this and hoist him up to the steeples and stuff, because he was a little man. And uh, it was easy, to, so he got to do all the high work. <laughs> well, he was kind of a quiet man, but he was always polite and just an interesting character. He saved everything. One example is he had gall bladder surgery. We have his gallstones, we have his gold teeth. I knew Ed really well. He was a very interesting man. And he was always busy uh, organizing something and putting on displays. And he was very uh, stern and he wasn't a, a, a jokey guy. He didn't joke, you know. And sometimes you kind of had to read into it. He was sincere and interesting, and he was always in a hurry. You know, if you met him out here, he'd say, yeah, good morning, and the way he'd go, you know. He just never threw anything away. <laughs> it was just, just unreal. You couldn't imagine how <laughs> much what there was in here. This is the box when he had the skating rink for the kids, and he had signs he'd put up, no skating. He had candy bars in here, tells here how much they were, a nickel, and... But he wasn't uh, soft with kids or anything, you know. He didn't gush all over them, and he was, he was he'd, you know, say, is that all you want? And, hand it, you know, they give him his money, and the way he'd go. He did, but he, 
you could depend on him and he was always here. Ed was born in Wisconsin, but he moved here with his parents and as a youngster, he needed something to do, so he worked in grocery stores, and uh, then he decided that he liked that so well, that was something that he would like to do for his life. His wife's folks bought the store for them. He was very prosperous during the Depression. Well, in 1938, Lydia had the first of a series of strokes, and he put in a hand powered elevator in the back of the store. And right here is where the, I'm just telling you that, that's where the elevator came up. And that's how he got her up upstairs. And she died in 1940, and uh, he was pretty devastated. And his son took the wedding dress, but we, we found the wedding veil, and then we had to put in a, in a sealed box to preserve it. And in the 50s, it started tapering off, and then he would open it up in the afternoon, and uh, the kids would come in, and he sold them cheaper than the other stores, candy bars and, and pop and chips and stuff to the kids. These candy bars in the counter are left from 1987 when he went in the nursing home. It was his dream that it be a museum. In 1976, the Progress Club ladies came and kind of helped him straighten things up and then uh, he made labels and they helped him you know label things and and all the all the labels you see on the shelves are labels that he made and see he 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 labeled everything and i think this is cute girl won't you buy me an ice cream sundae boy sorry dear but i won't be here sunday <laughs> Ed willed the building to the city in 1988, and then um, it was turned over to the city in 1990. The Waika Ferry Historical Society was organized in order to, to do the work. The city didn't have the means of doing the work, and then grants were received, and it was a major, major overall. And every time we met, you know, you'd have a different bunch of women. And sometimes it got real interesting because they'd want to just oh, throw that away, you know. And uh, it's, it's wonderful that things were saved, but boy, it was <laughs> overwhelming, really overwhelming. I always ask kids what this one, what they think this is, and they said, well, that's a toilet plunger. And I said, that's metal. <laughs> but that's how you got the soap out of your clothes. And I think this is neat. Have you ever seen a, a double potato masher? <laughs> See, it, it, uh, you have to turn it to uh, toast your bread. The building was built in 1876, and it is the oldest business building in town. Originally, it was a saloon and a brewery. When Ed's, muse Ed's store here was a grocery store, there was five grocery stores on this main, little main street here. And I, oh, we had a doctor, we had a dentist, we had three filling stations. I mean, it, you know, it was really something. So what we did, we called our good friend Jerry from the Fillmore County Museum, which is about eight, nine miles from here. And Jerry came in and opened the door and just got in the front door, uh, two steps. And he said, make it a store. Make it like when Ed was here and that, like Ed had it. And so that's what we did.
and um, it, it's we've been real satisfied. Couldn't believe it sometimes when we had buses pull up out here. And You know, and how, how did you hear this? And, and uh, it, it's really interesting <laughs> that people that hear about it and, and come. Isn't that pretty? And people walk by here every single day. They live up the street and they have not been in here. And I always have said for a long time that we should just have our mayor. Well, he comes and, and sits in here when it's his turn on Sunday, but we should have a, a day, Ed's Museum Day. It's a treasure. This is the most common comment. What a treasure you have. Mary Solberg grew up in a Catholic household, attending church and surrounded by religious imagery. Now she uses spiritual icons as an influence for her paintings. Mary paints portraits that explore the nature and the duality of the sacred and the profane in life as well as in her art, creating visual metaphors. My name is Mary Solberg and I'm a visual artist. I've always had an aptitude for art. You can kind of go into the area that you etched. It's just always what I really wanted to do. It's almost a compulsion, I would have to say. It's kind of like being in the zone. I try to get in the studio every day that I can, that I'm able to. You know, it feels really great. Time goes by, passes, um, and it's, it's just a really, the process itself is, is just really gratifying. I'm definitely a portrait artist. I, I think that the eyes, tell a lot. I think, the, you know, it's a, it's a very obvious way to express an emotion because, you know, a face does give you a lot of information. I would say my portraits were more about a psychological impact. I call them everyday icons, various people from my life or historic people. I think there's sacred in all of us and so it's my way of sort of venerating, you know, just the everyday person. Before we leave you this week, we would like to share with you a unique and beautiful collection of elegant dress sculptures created by mixed media artist Leah Malo. Her whimsical creations explore the idea of clothing and the duality of self through the use of unusual and eclectic materials. Watch as the textures and forms of these unique sculptural pieces come to life with a language all their own. We'll see you next week, Off 90.
Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.